So from 33 to 38. Good morning. Okay, so let's turn to page 51 in the booklet. And here you have a positive share shirim. It's actually possible that there are a lot of my modern of Chassidus on this Pasuk. And it begins with the words, Tzena or Re'ena B'nei Tzien. Go out and see daughters of Tzien. Amelech Shleme, see the king Shleme Amelech. But Torah Shitra the Imran, look at the crown that his mother crowned him. Yem Chasim on the day of his wedding, Yem Simchas Libay, and the day that his heart was glad. By the way, this is one of the places <clears throat> where the Shechina, Hashem, Hashem's presence is compared to Imay. People raise the question about Hashem always being masculine, that's feminine. Here's one of the places where it's feminine. Hashem is, is compared to the mother, not the father. And these words, the day of the wedding and the day his heart was gladdened, is Madrasha. What does it mean? What's the day of the wedding? What's the day the heart was gladdened? So, Im Chasanasa, Zoom Map and Taylor. That's what we have here on the sheet. And that's what we'll be talking about them. That the wedding is, that in date is Matan Taylor. <coughs> so, we said this quite a few times throughout the year, but now it's the most relevant. I guess, Pesach and Shavuos. And that is that, which we have here in number 34, that there are two stages in the marriage, <clears throat> Erison and Nesuin. And Erison is the first stage, Nesuin is the final stage. And years ago, there was actually a 12 month period in between the two stages. And today it's all done at once. So when you go to a wedding and you watch a chuppah, the chassan puts the ring on the kala, and he says, Ariat, and then they do the Sheva brachas, then they go to the Yichud room. Years ago, this was broken up into two parts. The part with the ring was the first stage, and that was called Erisim, which means halachically they're considered marriage, but they still weren't allowed to live together as husband and wife, but they are considered married, but the marriage is not complete. And then 12 months later, after they did, had 12 months to prepare for the wedding, then they went under the chuppah and they did the sheva brachas and yichud, and that was the <clears throat> completion of the marriage. That's when everything was complete. So the manager says that this is the difference between Pesach and Shavuos. Pesach, we uh, went through the process of Erisin with Hashem, which means we became connected, but not in a complete way. And then seven weeks later, with Shavuos, that's when we and Hashem became one in the most complete way, in the swing. I know this came up in other classes, that when we had the Beis Amigdash, Shemat and Torah, and everything we had before was Erisin, and when Mashiach comes, that'll be in the swing. Of course, it's all true, and everything is relative, like we said yesterday, thank you. But it means that the general idea is that the whole purpose of Torah mitzvahs is to become one with Hashem. And in terms of that oneness, there are many degrees of depth, how deep that oneness is. So the analogy for that is a marriage where they become one to the level of Erison, and then they become one to the level of Nisun. Then there's also the Zohar, which draws a parallel between the two psukim. If you look on page 52, and then we look on page 53. On page 52, it talks about marriage. And it says, this, uh, it's Pasuk in the uh, Parshas Metzorah. The suffer of Hashem and she will count, the, the wife will count seven days. 
seven pure days, and then she's pure, and then she can be together with her husband. You turn to page 53, it says, you count, uh, continue on page 54, seven weeks. So the Zara says, just like the woman counts seven days, and the purpose is to purify herself, so too you can count seven weeks to purify themselves so they could be one with Hashem. This analogy is used in many different ways, but one of them is something that everyone spoke about in the Sicha. I, if I remember correctly, I haven't seen it. Um, it's definitely not one of the edited Sichas, and I never was able to remember when the Rebbe said it. I mean, today we have these search engines, probably can find it. But it was a very beautiful Sicha, which is about something related to Rabbeinu Gershon. If you then turn to page 55, you have a picture of a Gemara, page in Gemara. But the reason why I made this picture is really not for the Gemara, but on the side is an arrow there. And it says, Rabbeinu Gershem Me'er Hagoyla. In other words, on the margin of the Gemara, every Gemara, the, the center is the Gemara. The morning. And one side is Rashi, and one side is Tasmus. And then on the margin, if you notice, there's other small little commentators. One of the commentaries on the side is Rabbeinu Gershon. And next to his name, it says the words Me'er HaGoyla, which means the one who lit up the exile. He lit up the Golis. And there's a discussion amongst the Farshim, why did he merit to have such a title? You don't find this with anyone else. Now, of course, if the reason is because he accomplished great things, he taught us great things, he made the... Um, um, a lot of, um, uh, you know, Takaris, he instituted certain things. So did so many other rabbis. Why would one specific, uh, uh, one of the Rabbeinu Gershon, <coughs> chosen out of all the other rabbis and was given this title? So who's Rabbeinu Gershon? Rabbeinu Gershon lived about a thousand years ago. He lived before Rashi, lived in Germany. I mean, these were one of those cities that changed countries because it was by the border when there was a time in history, I think Mainz, what under one country's time, another, another country. And there's a fascinating story with him. It's uh, the story is actually found in a, um, in a book that's given out, that was published by Marcus. And it's called Rabbeinu Gershom Eragola. Basically, he's the one, he instituted a few things, which is accepted by all Jews, all Ashkenazic Jews. And one of them was that he had a personal story. We know that according to Allah, a man could marry more than one wife. And that's the way it was until a thousand years ago. He married two wives, and he had it. And the reason when, when it usually happened was when they married one wife and had no children, like the story in Chumash with Abraham Avinu. So then they married another woman so they can have children. And that's what happened to him. He lived in a place where there was an incident with the king. The king's daughter was uh, very sick, and nobody was able to cure her, and she was about to die. And he offered his services as a doctor to help. But initially, they, they laughed at it, but then he actually saved her life. As a result of that, the king uh, gave him a position, and he used to call him and used to consult with him. And at one time, the king said that he has a desire to have a throne like Shleim HaMelech. We all know Shleim HaMelech had this miraculous throne, and he wanted to have such a throne. Who in the world could build a throne like that? But he was who he was. He was one of these tzaddikim, like the Rambam, and like Rashi, like the Rebbe, that not only did they have knowledge in Torah, they had knowledge in every field of wisdom in the world. So he was a doctor, 
but he was also knowledgeable in any other wisdom. And he said he'll do it for him, he'll build him such a throne. It was a big project. And he had a lot of people working there. He was in charge of the project and he built the throne and the king was ecstatic. The people who were not so happy about it were the other advisors. They were extremely jealous. And unfortunately, it happened very often. And because of that, they plotted to undermine him one way or another. And they looked for ways of making some sort of false accusation because they hated him so much out of jealousy. And they accused him that even though he made a beautiful throne, but in the process, he stole a lot of gold. The problem is there was no way of proving it. Normally, the way to prove it is, okay, there's X amount of gold that was given to you. Let's weigh the throne and see if it has the same weight of gold. If it doesn't, that means that you took off some gold for yourself personally. But this thing was huge and heavy and nobody would know how to weigh it. The only one who would have the wisdom to know how to weigh it was he himself. But of course, he, why would he do that and undermine himself? So the second wife who we married wasn't that loyal. And she found out from him what has to be done. She gave over the secret to them. They waited. The reason why there wasn't the same amount of gold is not because anyone stole anything, has to show them, but because when you work, a lot of the gold gets lost. Anyway, as a result of that, they, uh, they, this is the king that he saved his daughter. He ruled that he should be executed. And how do they, how do they plan to execute him? They put him up, one of the ways they did, they had a high tower, put him up in this high tower, locked the door, and he would just starve to death. Put him up in this high tower. His other wife, who was loyal to him, and she was at Sadekis, uh, came to the place where the tower was away from the whole town, all the way out of town. And uh, she called out to him, and she was shocked to hear that he's still alive. And then he told her what to do to be able to escape. Again, you see genius, brilliance, he was a big tzaddik. And I remember the details, but something along the lines that he told her to get a certain worm. He told her to get very thin string and rope and a knife. Basically what he did was he had her put this, this uh, worm on the wall, tie something to it that there was food, like bait in front of the worm. So the worm kept climbing up the wall climbed up all the way to the window because it was going after the bait. When it got to the window, there was a thin string attached to it. The thin string was attached to a thicker string and the thicker string to a thicker string. And eventually they brought up uh, a knife or a saw. And they brought up rope. He was able to saw the bars of the window and he was able to have a rope and he made himself a, a ladder out of the rope. And he, went out the window and he climbed down and he escaped. It's a fascinating story with a lot of details. After that, he came out with a ruling that we see today people are not on the level that they used to be and marrying two wives leads to too much jealousy. So he came out with a decree that no longer should anyone marry more than one wife. And it's known as Cherem Drabeinu Gershon. Cherem is a very harsh word. Actually, in general, we don't even pronounce the word because it means excommunication. Not only if someone violates this, he's in trouble, but he should be excommunicated from the Jewish community. Nobody should have any dealings with this person. And, and um, that's what he instituted and was accepted because he was the leader of Jewry and everyone accepted this ruling. <clears throat> so, by the way, he made a number of things they are all called Cher Amir Gershon. Just one of them, which you might not have heard, but it's just interesting to know why we're at it, is that, and it's part of also the story that happened, that he uh, ruled, he gave a decree that if, it, if there's an envelope addressed to a person and it's sealed, no one else is allowed to open it. And if they do, there should be cheir in the Rabbi Gersh. Actually, I heard a story from Dr. Feldman that there was once someone who had a question and uh, they wanted to ask the Rebbe the question, so they gave Dr. Feldman the letter, he gave it to the Rebbe, and they never got an answer. And he told them to wait, to wait, to wait, they still didn't get an answer. So finally, he mustered up courage, and when he met with the Rebbe, he said this person uh, didn't get an answer. 
So the Rebbe said, I never got a letter from them. So he said, I myself brought the letter in. So the Rebbe pulled out the envelope. <laughs> On the envelope, the person wrote, Dr. Feldman. It's a sealed envelope, but it says, Dr. Feldman, I don't open up letters that are not addressed to me. So basically, uh, the Institute, a number of things that he saw at that time, obviously it was sort of a, uh, a transition time we saw there was a, a, a weakness in the, in the, in the, um, where Eden was standing spiritually, and he made quite a few rules. So this is a rule that, that brought so much benefit. So the question is, okay, it brought a lot of benefit, but so did so many people. Look, the Rambam, we just spoke about the Rambam. The Rambam, look what he did. He made a Shulchan Aruch, the first one to do it. And as a result of that, we have books today that we can just, a handbook on halacha, it was never in existence before. Why shouldn't he be called Mera Gaila? In fact, every other tzaddik did something which they really enlightened and enhanced our situation here in Golas. So the answer is, this is uh, what the Rebbe said by Fabrengen. It said he brought it from others that, that say this. I think the Rebbe even said it's not clear who is the source, but the content is definitely um, um, Correct. And that is that he made another takana. There's another thing that he instituted. And that is that even though Alpi Halacha, if a man divorces his wife and she doesn't want to accept it, according to Halacha, it's valid. He instituted that it should not be valid unless she accepts it willingly. So, okay, so we have two takanas. Still doesn't explain why he should get that title. So, this is the way it's explained. That Hashem and Bnei Yisrael are husband and wife. Hashem is the husband and we're the wife. Which means husband and wife down here and the concept of husband and wife down here, that kind of relationship evolves from the true relationship which is Hashem and Bnei Yisrael. And when a Bezdin down here makes a ruling, it affects us down here and affects all the spiritual worlds whatever is sort of the counterpart of the things down here. It affects everything up there, which corresponds to what's going on down here. The reason why we're in Golos is because we weren't loyal to Hashem. And therefore, there's a fear that Hashem might decide to divorce us, like a husband who divorces his wife, who's not loyal to him. So what did he do? He instituted a halacha, that a man cannot divorce his wife against her will. That's a halacha for humans. But his real intention was halacha for Hashem, that Hashem is also sort of bound to the laws of the best. He can't divorce us against our will. And what if a, if a yidin say, we don't care, we want this, we, we don't want this relationship, so we know, and I'll still show it to you inside, that there's no such thing. Every Yid wants to be connected to Hashem, and there's no Jew that doesn't want to. And even if they say they don't want to, that's not the real person. That's all on the outside. That's external. That's the Yitzhahara forcing him to say something which he doesn't want to say. So therefore, it means it's impossible for Hashem to divorce us. And that's what it means, in the time of Golas, especially when the Golas became, took on sort of another level of intensity. And there was this fear that Chas Shalom, as a result of that, Hashem could sever the connection. So what he did was he instituted the halacha, which is binding not only for us, but so to speak, binding to Hashem. And therefore, it, it won't happen. By the way, it doesn't mean Chas Shalom that otherwise Hashem would have uh, abandoned us. What it means to say is, because Hashem already made an oath and he swore that his relationship with us is unconditional, is forever. But it means that the relationship should be, this, this unconditional connection should be more revealed. That's what his takana accomplished. But there's another problem. Hashem might say, okay, I'm stuck with you guys. Rabbein Gershon tied my hands, can't do anything about it. So I'll marry someone else. And that's who I'm gonna lead my life with. So he made another takana, that a man can't marry two wives, can't have two wives. How long ago was this? Just a thousand years ago. It's after, it's after David and that he have Yeah, it's a thousand years ago. 
Not that long ago. This is a thousand years ago. What? What? In the room? It's cute, okay. I mean, after all, it makes honey, you know. It's cute and sweet, as long as it stays far away. <laughs> so, now we understand on a deeper level why it's called Meir HaGoyla. He lit up the Golas means he brought into the Golas the security and this connection between us and Hashem that in spite of Golas, it's not going to affect us. Hashem's relationship with us will openly stay the same and not that he'll sever the connection and not that he will give his attention anywhere else but that Hashem remains with us and we remain with him forever. That's why it's called Meir HaGoyim. There's a question, though, that people ask. In Sephardic communities, they've never accepted his ruling. And that's why in Sephardic countries, in those countries where it is practiced that there are men have more than one wife, even Jewish men will have more than one wife. But if, uh, and halakhically, they're not bound to his ruling because he was Ashkenazi and they're Sephardic. But if the reason is a spiritual reason, so how do you explain that? It should have been for everybody. Again, I'm still looking for the sikh inside. I hope they'll find it. What I remember is the Rebbe said that in the Sephardi world, the Gullus was never so severe like in the Ashkenazic world, both physically and spiritually. Spiritually is because Ashkenazim were in Gullus under the Christians. Christians is Abu Dazara. And therefore, our Gullus were in a place of impurity. The Sephardic Jews were in Golis and mainly under Islam. Islam, even though they are who they are, but as far as Abu Dazara, that religion is not Abu Dazara for a non Jew because they believe in one God. So that means, on, from a spiritual perspective, we weren't in such a deep Golis like in the time, like in those who lived in Ashkenazic countries, because we were under a rule of pure Abu Dazara, and the Ashken Sephardic Jews were under a rule which is not pure Abu Dazara. In Begashmias, most of the horrors of Golas that took place were in Ashkenazi countries, not in the Sephardic countries. What we're witnessing now, all this, all this uh, hate coming from the Arabs, and uh, this is sort of the, the biggest dilemma in our generation today, is something new. And I don't know if it was brought up in classes, but this is Mamish prophesied in so many places that before Mashiach comes, the main problem we're going to have is with the children and descendants of Ishmael. And we see it with our eyes. All the years, it was all the Christians. Everything was coming from Rome. The Pope and the priests, the Christian Catholics. And they're the ones who made all the pogroms. They're the ones who, uh, what was it called when they went through the different countries? Um, what? Crusades, right. They killed so many people. Uh, all this was was uh, all this was uh, under the banner of Christianity, and 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 not so much in the Sparta countries. So being that the Golas was never so intense, it didn't need this takana. In the Ashkenazic world, the Golas was more intense. We needed this takana to be able to maintain that relation with Hashem. This point that I said that I mentioned. Is actually found when I put this booklet together. I guess that I didn't have the Rambam the Hebrew English, even though it's been around for a while, but I never updated it. But if you look at page 56, this is a famous Rambam, and this is a Rambam that Rebbe quotes a lot. And in fact, if we can just, um, what would I say, uh, make a little detour for a moment, one of the things that we see about Rambam is something really amazing. And the Rebbe brought this to our attention that some of the most basic fundamental principles of Hasidus, which we always looked at it, that this is something which Hasidus introduced to the world is actually found in the Rambam in halachic language. One of them is this. These are the laws of, on page 56, you're looking at the laws of divorce. And the Rambam writes, what if there's a case 
where a person is obligated to divorce his wife. They're not allowed to live together and he doesn't want to. So the Rambam writes, so the best then have to force him to force uh, um, this person to divorce his wife. And what if he doesn't want to? And he says he doesn't want to. And if he doesn't want to, it's not valid. So the Rambam says, they beat him until he says the words, I do want to. However, no one ever gave this explanation like the Rambam, even though this is written in Gemara, it's, it's been around for hundreds of years or more. The Rambam writes, but he doesn't really want to, so what's the purpose? What are we, we're, we're fooling ourselves. He, we know for sure that if he wouldn't be forced, he wouldn't do it. So when he says, I want to, it's not true. And the Rambam says these words, these are the Hebrew which underline that when you say someone is forced, it only applies to something that he does, which is not related to Torah. So for example, you force somebody to sell something, you force something to give a, a gift when they don't want to, it's invalid because they're doing it against their will. But when it comes to mitzvahs, every yid wants to do what Hashem wants him to do. And therefore, in truth, he wants to give the divorce because that's what the Torah says he has to do. The fact that he's screaming, I don't want to, that's not him. That is the Sahara forcing him to say, I don't want to. This is one of the most basic principles of Chassidus. This is in Tanya chapter 18, 19. All the sikhs of the Rebbe from, from the beginning till now, everything is all about this point that every Jew deep down in his heart wants to daven, wants to learn, wants to serve Hashem. No matter how far they are, everything you see is only on the outside. But inside, he wants to serve Hashem. And this is based on Hasidus that yet has a Nefesh of Kiz, and the Nefesh of Kiz is unconditionally connected. But where do you find this in the Nigla, the revealed part of Torah? Here's in the Rambam. And the Rambam says that, so therefore, when we say that a man can divorce his wife against her will, it's also the same thing that even if a Yid says, I don't mind or I, or I want to God to be divorced, it doesn't matter what he says because it's, he's only being forced to say those words by his Yitzhahara. The real you wants the connection with Hashem. One of the other things in the Rambam is, everyone knows that one of the main, um, one of the fundamental principles of Tanya and the Baruch Shem Tov is that Hashem creates the world every second. And if for one second he would stop, the whole world would cease to exist. So if you remember the beginning of the Rambam, which uh, we just had the, the, the Siyam, and Nigel taught us the beginning of the Rambam, he says something very strange. If we were to think that Hashem is not here, then the world couldn't exist. How could you even say such words? If we were to think that Hashem is not here, would the Rambam write such words? What do you mean if to think of Hashem is not here? I mean, this is something which is so, out of the question that it doesn't even make sense to say if I were to think hypothetically. So the answer is the Rambam doesn't mean shown, that Hashem doesn't exist. The Rambam means if Hashem's energy with which he sustains the creation would no longer be there, then the creation would no longer be there. That means in essence, he's saying exactly what it says in Shara Yichud Vamuna, and that is that Hashem's life force and energy that sustains creation is there every second. And if it would be removed one moment, the world would cease to exist. And there are many other things in Rambam, which are really fundamentals of Hasidus. Okay, let's go back. So this is, um, Let's go over these few phrases. Yom Chasen is about the Torah, I showed you. 34 are the two stages of marriage, Erisin and Nisuin. By the way, the first stage can also have another term, it's sometimes called Kiddushin. The Sefer of Hashem is that's in reference to a woman and her husband. Sfat Lachem Sheva Shabbos is seven weeks, is Az and Hashem. Abeinu Gershem Me'er HaGerla. And number 38 is the quote from the Rambam, Yitzra Hara Onsei. When a Yid says, I don't want to listen to Torah, it, it's really his Yitzra forcing him to say something which he doesn't really believe. Believe it or not. That's the way it is. 
Okay, so now we'll go to number 3940. This is something which there are many, many memorials starting from the Alter Rebbe that talk about this and explain this. There are many Sikhs that Rebbe talks about this. And that is based on the Gemara. So being that we have the Gemara in the book, let's read from the Gemara about this. Let me just find the page here. So it's on in the booklet, it's page 12. Gemara, it's uh, this is the art school Gemara, where you see the arrow on top on page 12. Dara Shreb Simoy. Shreb Simoy said the following. At the time of Matan Torah, when the Yidin declared, Nasa Nishma, we will do and we will listen. 600,000 angels descended. And what did they do? They gave They tied two crowns to every Jew. Echad connected Nasa. One crown because they said the word Nasa, we will do. And Bechot Kenegadishma, they said, we will listen. The Kivish Chotu, once they sinned, which means they sinned with a golden calf, Yardu Meya Besram Riba Malachi Chabola, then destructive angels came down, but how many? Not 600,000, 1,200,000. And they took away those crowns. Uperkum, Shenemma, by Isnaslu Ben Israel, as Edio Mehar Cheru. And the children of Israel were stripped of their jewelry, which is the jewelry. The jewelry is the Nasa and Ishma crowns that they were wearing. What did Hashem do with the crowns? So it says on the other side of the page, Amr Yechanan, it was all given to Moshe Rabbeinu. And then it says, Amr Lakish, but don't worry, when Mashiach comes, Hashem will give us back the crowns. We'll get it back. So make room on your head for two crowns. There's another muscle which is brought down in Chassidus, and that is that um, there was a king, he had two sons, and he made three crowns. He put one crown on the head of one son, one crown on the head of another son, and a third crown on his own head. So there's two Midrashim, one Medrash that talks about two crowns, one that corresponds to Nasa, one that corresponds to Nishma. Then there's another Medrash that says there were three crowns. So the question is, where does the third one come from? We'll soon explain the details, but the general answer is as follows. If you look at the words again, it says, Bishoshe Gdimu Yisrael Nasa Nishma. When Yin said Nasa before Nishma, which means there were three things that happened here. One reward was because they said Nasa, they committed themselves Nasa. One reward is because they committed themselves Nishma. And the third crown is because they said Nasa before Nishma, not Nishma before Nasa. So we have to explain what all three things are. What's Nasa, what's Nishma, and what's unique about saying Nasa before we say Nishma. One more piece related to this. Look at the next page 13, where it says in the English, a related narrative. Ahumina, the Chazia, the Rabbah, the Kamaim Bishmaitza. There was a Sadducee. This was a tribe of people that were didn't believe in Torah. And he saw Rabbah that he was studying Torah. The Yasra at Baasa the Yuday Tese Kara. He put his fingers under his leg. Become and he was he was so concentrated that he was actually crushing his finger because Mabon is Bose Dama and his fingers were flowing with blood and he didn't even realize. Oh my lay, so he said to Rava, I'm a Pazisa, you guys, you're an impulsive people. Why? The Kadmisa pull Michael, Michael, you put your mouth before your ears. What does that mean? You still have this impulsiveness. Look at you, you're learning, and look what's happening to you. Where was impulsiveness? 
First, you should have heard what Hashem wants. And then you would think about it. You want to accept it or not. And then you should say that you want to accept it. You went ahead and sort of impulsively right away said yes. Right now also we see that you're so involved in your learning, you don't even know what you're doing. Look what you're doing. Your finger is bleeding. So what did, what did he answer him? Omale, he said to this person, Anan, we, page 14, the Musa, we go in the ways of complete faith. It says, Tumas Yisharim Tanchem, the perfect faith of the upright, that will lead them, meaning lead them in the right direction. Hanach Inshi the Sagan the Alilusa, those people who go in the ways of perversiveness, Ksibbuhu the Selev Baidin. And the perverseness of the faithfulness will destroy them. So you want to hold on and be careful whatever you think about it, you do want to do, you don't want to do. And of course, we know this was the story with the nations of the world. That Hashem first offered the Torah to the children of Edom, of Esau. And they asked, what does it say in the Torah? And when he told them what it says, they didn't accept. And then he went to the children of Ishmael and they asked, what does it say in the Torah? which is normal. You say to somebody, I want to sell this to you. And like, what, are you what are you selling me? Before I buy it, I don't hear what's, what's the merchandise. So one of them, he told that you're not allowed to commit adultery. One of them, he told that you're not allowed to kill. And they said, this is not for us. Such a Torah that doesn't allow to kill. Torah doesn't allow to commit adultery. We can't keep up with that. When it came to the Eden, they didn't ask any questions. They didn't make any conditions. They just said, unconditionally, we're there for you. Whatever you say, not so the Nishma. So to explain this, uh, again, like I said, there's a lot of my modern. It's explained in a very deep way. In so many modern, what does it correspond to spiritually? There's no end. So I'm just going to say the, the tip of the iceberg. Maybe it's not even the tip of the iceberg of what is explained regarding these two things. What is the difference between Nasa and Nishma? But first of all, like everything else, let's see the basics. Where does it say Nasa and Nishma? So if you look in the Chumash, on page 32, it's underlined. Moshe came to the Eden and told him about the laws of the Torah. And the Eden said, call Hashem Nasa. Whatever Hashem says, we will do. That's still not what we're looking for. Look on page 32a. Over there it says, Moshe read the covenant to the Eden. By Yemra, the Eden said, Nasa So we see that one time they said Nasa, another time they said Nasa Vinishma. And that means that there are three things here. One is Nasa in itself is something amazing that is deserving of reward. A nishma, and, and then there's the saying them together, a nasa before nishma. So the general explanation is as follows. What was this argument? Why don't you think before? But I have a different question. How could you even tell someone, I'm going to do what you tell me before you hear what you say? A very impulsive person, you tell somebody, I want you to do something to me. Yeah, consider it done. And they run to do it, but they don't know what you want them to do yet. <laughs> very good to be devoted and loyal, but you have to hear first before you run to do it. So basically, what it meant to say, the is saying it's irrelevant what it's gonna be. We're committing ourselves, not we're doing, we're committing ourselves to do what Hashem says, regardless whether we know what it is, before we even know what it is. It makes no difference if it's big or small or hard or easy, we're committed. And what does Nasa and Nishma mean? Again, how could Nasa be before Nishma? Nishma means you have to hear first. So the answer is Nishma doesn't always mean hear literally. Like in Shema Yisrael, it doesn't mean hear audio, listening. Shema means listen with the mind, to absorb, to understand, to perceive something. And that's what Nishma means. That you should understand that Hashem Elokeinu, Hashem Achon. And this is what Eden was saying. There's two parts to Torah and Mitzvahs. One part is action, commitment to do what needs to be done. And the other part is that Hashem wants us to learn, to study, to understand, 
and to intellectually understand Torah as deep as we possibly can. In fact, that's the halacha. That when a child is five years old, just teach them Torah Tzivalon. They're just five years old, teach them Torah Tzivalon. And as they get older, day by day, week by week, month by one month, you, you expand and you upgrade their level of learning. And that person should learn more and more as, they, as, the, as the brain develops. So basically, we're making a commitment on two levels. One is a commitment for action, and the other is a commitment for learning and understanding. And now the question is, why are both necessary? In fact, there's a big question. Wouldn't it be even greater if Yidin would say just Nasa? Hashem, I don't need to understand. It doesn't matter whether I do understand or don't understand. Nasa, I'm committing myself to you, and that's it. So obviously, even if a person would commit himself to Hashem, unconditional commitment to follow Torah, Hashem is not satisfied, is not happy with that. He wants a commitment to learn, to understand, that we understand what we're doing and why we're doing to a certain extent. Why is that necessary? If anything, doesn't that interfere and wouldn't that sort of uh, detract in some way from that commitment because it's based on my understanding? No, more real. What? It's more real because you can actually be part of your... Okay, so this is what we're going to go into tomorrow, Mr. Shem. The next comedy comes up in a second. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you, Rabbi.